Hello, and welcome to HAP 360, the history of project management. I am Justin Park, and I'll be your speaker for this lecture. Here is some background information about me. I'm an IT information security student at GMU, and I have taken a couple of project management courses during my time as an undergrad. Some of you in IT may be familiar with the topics that we're about to discuss in this lecture, and that is perfectly okay. This presentation is part of the HAP 360 course on information systems in healthcare and management taught by Professor James Oakes at George Mason University, Department of Health Administration and Policy. Here's the scope of this lecture. I'll be teaching you the topics based on my research, my own knowledge, and what I think is valuable based on personal experience. I'll not be able to cover everything I would like to, but I'll be able to provide a decent summary of important topics you may need to know or learn about in the future. Before we talk about project management, let's define what a project is. A project is a temporary endeavor to offer and create a unique product or service. Project management, on the other hand, is the application of knowledge, skills, techniques, tools, activities, and people in order to meet the client's needs or the project requirements. Here's an example of an ancient project. This is the ancient Babylonian city of Uruk, built over 6,000 years ago. If you're a history buff like me, you know that this city is most famous for one of the oldest stories of human history, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Here, we see the beautiful ancient temples of Artemis. It was once regarded as one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, and was considered to be twice as big as the Greek Parthenon. There are so many architectural wonders in the world, but we gotta ask, what do each of these architectures have in common? Well, first, they had exceptional planning, coordination, allocation of resources, and multiple stakeholders, or people who shared a strong interest or concern with the development of a project. Here, we see many different kinds of stakeholders, architects that design, the mathematicians calculate, the artists adorn, builders create, and so on and so forth. Now, let us examine the basic elements of ancient project management. First, we have the management of people and resources, scheduling tasks, such as when the shipment of goods would arrive, and the coordination of tasks and people working on the project. All these elements are still prevalent and relevant to modern project management. However, it's unfortunate that there are no historical records or documentation on how these projects were precisely handled. Now, near the end of the 19th century came a demand for project management. One of the reasons for this demand was the growing complexity of commerce. During this time, there was an increased need for complex structure, the manufacturing of goods, newer modes of transportation, and large nationwide infrastructure projects. Because of this, business leaders began to face the issues of having to organize and coordinate tens and thousands of laborers, manufacturers, assembly workers, and go through an unprecedented quantity of raw materials, tools, and resources. Thus, creating the demand for project managers and leaders. These are some of the first examples where project management was implemented for a large-scale project. The first major large-scale project management was the building of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1862 and the restoration of the South after the American Civil War. In the late 20th century came the foundation for modern-day project management, and that foundation begins with Frederick Taylor, a mechanical engineer who sought innovative ways of improving processes in industrial and steel engineering. He is also known as the author of The Principles of Scientific Management, which discusses his theories about management and synthesized workflows. He also created the work breakdown, which we will discuss later, and the piecemeal work, which is paying workers a fixed rate for every unit produced or action performed regardless of time. He also replaced traditional methods of management with his own scientific studies on tasks and workflows. And finally, he laid the foundations for the field of project management, as well as inspiring his colleagues and other project managers with his findings beliefs, and writings. One of these inspired colleagues was Henry Ghent, who also happened to be a mechanical engineer and a management consultant as well. By expanding upon Frederick's findings and creating his own system of project management, Henry Ghent was able to become one of the most influential project managers in history, thus being named as the forefather of project management. Henry Gantt's most famous creation was the Gantt chart, which used rows and columns to track progress. Even after Gantt's death, the Gantt chart continued to be used in many large-scale projects, such as the development of the Hoover Dam and the U.S. Interstate Highway System. Here is an image of the original Gantt chart developed by Henry Gantt in World War I. I'm sure it looks confusing to most people, but on closer inspection, while using the legend on the bottom, it's actually not difficult to interpret this chart. Here is a more simplified image of the Gantt chart that was used back then. Notice the project tasks on the left-hand column, the bars that correspond to the right, and the months on top. The top bar represents the overall project, while the bars below are some of the tasks within the project. The length of the bar represents the expected duration of each task that will take to completion. 
One of the simple techniques that people did with Gantt charts was simply measuring the progress of each bar by filling it in. There are many other techniques that people back then implemented, such as putting a planned bar to compare the progress or using special symbols to indicate milestones. While Gantt charts were popular for scheduling and project management, they weren't optimal for intertask relationships. Often these Gantt charts were haphazardly used, along with other informal project management tools for ad hoc projects. Those who know Latin knows that ad hoc means for this. Basically, these tools were used for immediate scheduling instead of optimal planning. However, during and after the early 1950s, two mathematical scheduling techniques were developed alongside each other. The first technique is PERT, or the Program Evaluation and Review Technique. PERT was developed by an operational research team from Booz Allen Hamilton for the U.S. Navy in 1958. The main reason for why PERT was developed was for Project Polaris, a missile program with such great complexity that it had led to the development of new project management techniques. The purpose of PERT is to look, analyze, and evaluate various tasks and their relationships with one another rather than their durations. As a result, Project Planet became much more simplified due to the implementation of PERT. Compared to looking at a Gantt chart or a work breakdown structure, PERT was much easier to look at due to its visual simplicity rather than compacting a lot of complex data into an aggregate of rows and columns. Alongside the development of PERT was the Critical Path Method, or CPM. Because these two were developed alongside one another, it can be said that both the CPM and PERT are complementary to one another, which you will see in a later example. Now what CPM actually is, is just an algorithm for scheduling project activities. The goal of CPM is to determine the minimum amount of time it takes to complete a project by identifying the longest stretch of time it takes to complete a chain of dependent activities. Now, I know this explanation sounds confusing, and the example I'm about to show might still be a bit confusing, but actually, in fact, the first time I saw the critical path, I asked myself, how can the longest sequence of tasks be the shortest pass? But I'll also be showing another example that's more relatable to help illustrate PERT and the critical path method. This right here is a PERT diagram. This chart represents a seventh month project with five milestones that are connected by six activities. The milestones are represented in circles. The activities are the arrows that are labeled A through F, and T represents the amount of months it would take before the reaching next milestone. I apologize if the milestone numbers throw you off. In this diagram, each milestone, 10, 20, 30, and etc., represents products 1, 2, 3, and etc. The reasons why they use tens in this case is in the case of the adding additional milestones to be added later on to the future. Looking from this diagram, we can see the critical path would take seven months for the project to be completed. You may ask, why is it seven months and not six months? Well, I'll explain in two slides later. To calculate the duration of task, we use the formula below. We combine the optimistic or the shortest time with pessimistic or the longest time and the most likely time it takes to complete a project. We multiply the most likely time by four to give it a higher weight and then divide the total by six in order to give the average duration. To help illustrate PERT and the critical path method, let's think of a simple scenario where you wanted to make dinner. You can see from this diagram how each task are related to one another and what the process flows are. On the top, you're making a salad. At the same time, in the middle, you're making pasta and on the bottom, you're heating up some sauce. If I was to ask, what is the critical path in this scenario? Now remember that the critical path is the minimum amount of time it takes to complete a project, but what we're actually looking for is the longest stretch of time. You can finish making a salad and heating some sauce early, but you can't have a full dinner without the pasta. Thus, the middle row from the boiling water to cooking the pasta and setting it on the table is the critical path. Another important tool for project management is the work breakdown structure. You may remember earlier that I mentioned that the work breakdown was developed by Frederick Taylor, but was improved and used during the Polaris project. This technique became very effective for project management and was published by the Department of Defense in 1962 for project management use. A work breakdown structure was basically a hierarchical model that was used to understand a project's scope by decomposing tasks into smaller subtasks. The older work breakdown structures kind of look like hierarchical trees, while the more modern ones tend to look a bit more logical. Originally, the older work breakdown structures focused primarily on the hierarchy of tasks, but more modern implementations also included additional features such as adding cost breakdown, process ordering, and scheduling tasks. Here is the original model of a work breakdown structure. You can see how some tasks are split into smaller subtasks. This is a more modern work breakdown structure that I made through Microsoft Project. You can see the work breakdown structure on the far left column. You can also see the tasks, duration, start and end times, which tasks precede which, and resources such as materials or workers. There are also a lot of other interesting things you could do in Microsoft Project, and it is also a very powerful tool when using project management. And that concludes the lecture. Thank you for listening to my lecture on the pre-agile history of project management.